I'm attorney Phil Giacino, and this is Finding Common Ground here on Altice Channel 115. Got a great show planned for this beautiful Saturday. I have Jeffrey Deskovic in the uh, chair next to me. He's going to be my co-host for today. Got a lot of great topics. Jeff has been a, sh uh, a guest on my show previously, so if you watched the show before, you'll see him and you'll uh, recognize him right away. Just for my audience to know, I will be going back on 103.9 FM LI News Radio. I'm probably going to start on September 21st. It was going to be September uh, 14, but I have an important uh, case in court, and the show starts at 5. So I'm not so sure I'd be at the airport to do my radio show at 5 o'clock. So we're probably going to start on the 21st. That will be called Phil Giacino Drive at 5, and that will be Sean Hannity's last hour that he used to do at 103, 5 to 6 o'clock. It's going to be a great show. Call in. I'm going to have Jeffrey on at some point. Uh, I'm going to have uh, Marty Tankliff, uh, Congressman Zeldin. We're going to have a, a great, great time doing that show. But for today, we're going to talk about the wrongfully convicted, things Jeff is working on, legislation, uh, cases. So I'm going to bring him in right now. Welcome aboard, Jeff. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Good. What I wanted to do, and we're not going to dwell too much on the past, we're looking forward, but so the audience uh, can understand a little bit about you, get a little context. I always like to have context, even for me, so that they know who they're listening to. Now, in 1989, there was a murder and a rape committed. Yes. And 1990, you were arrested and charged with those crimes. Correct. You were ultimately wrongfully convicted. I'll put the word wrongfully right out because obviously you didn't do it. And you served about 16 years in jail. Yes. Now, during that time, I'm sure motions were made and appeals and all of that. And at some point, so right now the audience understands you did 16 years in jail for a crime you did not commit. Somebody, in fact, was later convicted. Yes. So because of that wrongful conviction, that other person was out free for those 16 or so years, and they committed another murder, correct? Yes, no, but to specify, he was free for an additional three and a half years, and at that point he killed a second victim, was I caught see. for that, and then he was incarcerated. So for about 12 and a half years, we were both concurrently imprisoned, albeit in different prisons. Got it. And because of that wrongful conviction, it damaged your life. didn't destroy it because you're here today and doing great things, but it damaged your life, it affected your family, and it affected certainly the family of that next victim. Absolutely. That was killed by the murderer in the first case. Yes. So it has a profound, in fact, before the show we were talking about, it has a profound effect. It's not just the wrongfully convicted. It's the people that are out there that did the crime and future victims. It has a profound, profound effect. Now, at what, I do want to talk a little bit about the past in this respect. At what part of your life you're sitting in jail, right? You're trying to make the best of it. You're hoping you're going to get out someday. And you'll, you're one of the lucky ones. There are a lot of people that never see the light of day. Uh, Marty Tankliff was a, another one that was lucky. And it turns out he served a, a similar amount of time to you, and he became an attorney too. So these people are coming out, like yourself, with a goal, a purpose. But when did you at some point decide, I want to be a lawyer? Well, originally, in my teenage years, I wanted to be a lawyer because... Oh, so before this all happened to you. Correct. But towards the tail end of my incarceration, I decided that I wanted to be a lawyer specifically for the purpose of freeing other people who are wrongfully convicted, whereas that wasn't the goal when I wanted to be a lawyer before. I thought I was going to do personal injury I see. law. Okay. And when you decided you wanted to be a lawyer and you wanted to do this, did you, did you think it was a pipe dream or did you think... I hope to get out of here, because obviously if you don't get out of there, and, and even if you got out of there at some point, if you're a convicted felon, it's going to be much harder, almost impossible, especially for what you were charged with, to become a lawyer. So even if at 16 years they let you out or whatever, to become a lawyer would have been a pipe dream. Did you think it would be a reality when you thought about it? Uh, I, I went both ways on that. At times I thought that it was a pipe dream, and at other times being, being optimistic, I, I did not. So I kind of vacillated back mm -hmm. and forth. But it was crystal clear to me, as you correctly point out, that if I was to leave prison on parole rather than being exonerated, that the dream was pretty much uh, over, right. as to my thinking at that time. Although I quickly want to point out that there have been a number of people mm -hmm. who um, have 
uh, graduated law school and became, got admitted to the bar and practiced law, even with convictions. But you're right, nonetheless, that the odds of them agreeing to let me do that with a murder and a rape, right. the rape being the key part of that, exactly. it, it would have been virtually impossible. Not totally, but pretty damn near close. Now, there's a thing in the law you're aware of, relief from civil disabilities, which a judge can sign, and it would remove, let's say, a governmental agency's ability to give you a license. They can give you that license. But let's say a guy had a DUI, driving while intoxicated, a felony. He would have a better shot. Yeah, obviously. At getting cleared to practice law than what you were charged with. Correct. Because I don't think they'd want to touch that with a 10-foot pole. Uh, I agree. You know, maybe, like I said, maybe some other type of charge. But anyway, so you, uh, this is another question I like to ask people that are wrongfully accused, uh, convicted, I should say. Let's say at some point you're sitting in jail, and let's say at the 10-year mark, attorney walks in to visit you, and he says, I can get you out today, but you have to uh, admit that you did this, or you, you can't say you didn't do it. So in other words, a DA can get their pound of flesh out of you, but you will come out still a convicted man. Would you have taken that? No, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I had my own brush with that in, in reality. I mean, obviously, no attorney walked in and said that to me, but my brush and where I came close mm -hmm. to that at was that uh, I had to make a decision if I was going to take and complete the sex offender training program, right. which was a program that the parole board want, what wanted me to take. Uh, so that they felt I addressed the crime. So you and couldn't that, get and parole had, unless you And that it. had a guilt admission requirement right. tied to it. And then, secondly, when I actually made the parole board appearance, you know, I know that the parole board, they want to hear you express remorse, take responsibility, show insight. And if you don't do that and you instead stand mm -hmm. on your innocence, then there's a pretty good chance they'll deny you parole, thus extending your already unjust prison stay. So I had my two brushes with that in that vein, right. and I, I stood on my ground. I did not take the program, and when I went to the parole board, I, in fact, maintained my innocence. Now, I paid the price for that. I did an extra year of, of imprisonment before I was exonerated. But, you know, I can look back at that, Phil, and that's one of the, those two things were two of the best decisions I ever made in my life. You held true. Now, you're right. If you don't say, I did this, unless you're Morgan Freeman in Shawshank Redemption, you're not getting out. For the most part, they're going to say he hasn't learned his lesson, he won't take responsibility. But that's got to be the hardest thing for an innocent guy sitting there, and especially if you're told by an attorney or someone, we can get you out, but you got to, you got to take this class, you got to admit this. I don't know what I would do. You know, I, I'm a pretty uh, strong in my convictions. You probably know that by now if you see I do. my work. And I don't think I could say I did something or go to a class and sit there and say, yes, I raped somebody, so let's get, let's get uh, through with this thing. I, I don't know what I would do. I understand what you're saying, and you're right. It is very difficult, and I did, uh, I did wrestle with it. But my line of reasoning at that point, though, was, you know, they offered me to plead guilty after the trial was finished, but before the verdict was rendered. They offered mm -hmm. me a 5 to 15, and if I would have taken that, I would have been home by now. So I'm 15 years in already. I've done my minimum of 15 right. in life. So if I was going to do that, I would have did it back then. So I stood on it now, mm -hmm. and... Uh, look, you know, come hell or come holy water, I'm not admitting guilt to the parole board. So if that means I'm going to die in there, then, you know, so, so, so be, be it. it. Now, That's it, a hard thing to say, though. I know. Don't get me wrong. I know. I'm acknowledging the human side of what you're expressing. That is a hard thing to say. But, you know, I said it. And not just theory. I did it. I walked it. Now, when you were offered that 5 to 15 early on, yes. did you consider it? Uh, briefly. Sure, I did, briefly. You discussed it with your family? I did. And did they want you to take it so they'd see you in a, a number of years? No. My uncle, actually, who was uh, a marshal of Yonkers, uh, when I mentioned it to him, I thought he would be the best person to consult with. Mm -hmm. he, he, rather matter-of-factly, he said, did you do it? And I said, no. Then you have no choice. And, and he said, well, then you don't take it. Mm -hmm. Now, just quickly, I know we're still delving into the past a little bit, but these are, these are interesting topics, and I think it's important. Did you get, and now you were convicted, okay, I know that. Do you think you got a fair trial, or was the deck stacked, ag uh, stacked against you in some way? The deck was definitely stacked against me. Do we have a moment I'll just quickly Absolutely. mention? Sure. All right, so it was stacked against me in the following respect. So first of all, uh, the police officers, um, they didn't give completely truthful testimony. So I was, uh, the only evidence they had against me was a coerced false confession. And the police left the threat and false promise out of their narration of that interrogation. So it was stacked against me in that aspect. It was stacked against me in another aspect that my public defender, he, 
he never put my alibi witness on the stand. He never used the DNA, which excluded me before the trial. He never used that to argue that that proved the coercion confession was coerced and false. Why not? I don't know. And then he took a scattershot approach with respect to addressing the confession. So at times he was arguing to the jury that the confession never happened. At other times he was arguing yeah. it did happen, but it was coerced. Inconsistent. Yes. So come on, his credibility went out the window all over the pick a lane and, and go down it. Absolutely. Uh, and the last way the deck was stacked against me was that uh, so the victim's clothing, and specifically a bra, had been admitted into evidence. And that mm -hmm. correlated with one of the statements in my course, false confession, in which I said that um, I ripped the victim's um, bra off. The jury asked to see the bra, and that was a bright spot for the defense because we thought they're thinking like we want them to think because some bras, it would be physically impossible to uh, rip off of somebody. Right. And the jury asked to see the bra. And it was at that moment that the judge told us that uh, the clothing had been left in the courtroom overnight over the weekend and that apparently the uh, janitors thought it was you garbage and they, me. and they threw it out. I didn't know that. And the, he substituted the actual uh, clothing item for a, uh, substituted a photo for the bra in which That's he not said, the same. no, and he said, quote unquote, this is like verbatim here, you can almost see the bra in this photo. And he refused to grant the mistrial or strike testimony oh regarding it. So the stack was the DAC was stacked against me in all those aspects. And the last thing I'll quickly mention uh, that I was uh, 17 at the time of this mm -hmm. trial, and I was completely in over my head. I did mm -hmm. not fully understand everything that was going on. And my uh, lawyer took an extremely ex he took an extreme view of the attorney-client privilege to the point that he would not allow. Um, he would not allow any adult male member, like none of my uncles or even my mother, he would not allow them to participate in a conversation with him and me. When yeah, it, I would not do that. When it, when it came to making important decisions such as whether to testify or not. And I didn't understand what I was... No, especially, and I, I allow it with adults. I always say to them, you, you're sure you want that person in here? If you do, mom, dad, uncle, bring them in. If it'll help you, my client. But understand, once I can't, if there's going to be a, a leak or something like that, if they say something to somebody, I can't help that. Right. But at 17 years old, now, had, were you a senior when it happened, or had you graduated, or not yet? No, not yet. I was a sophomore in high school. At 17? Okay. Yes. Well, I failed a grade. I see. I was okay. picked on in school, and I was on the fringes, and so rather than go to summer school and then pass and be stuck with those same group of kids that picked on me, I okay. made the conscious decision not to go to okay. summer school so I could get left back. But still, 17, even in the eyes of the law, you're not an adult yet. You know, right. For purposes of contracts and all that. So Correct. I think that, that attorney, and again, I, I don't like to play Monday morning quarterback, but based on what you told me, he should have allowed to have other people in that room. Even like your uncle, he said, was a marshal. Yes. Somebody like that can give you a perspective at 17. You know nothing. Correct. Especially about these, these, you know, it's not like you're buying a car. This is going to affect you profoundly for the rest of your life. Yeah, you're right. And, and it did. Now, were there Brady violations at the trial? Which, and again, just for, for the audience, a Brady violation is when a case is being investigated and ultimately a defendant is charged, there's evidence that's gathered that the DA has to turn over to the defense attorney. And it can be anything that can exonerate or can be used for impeachment purposes. And it's pretty broad. The problem here we have prosecutors often that withhold things thinking, ah, I know the theory of the defense case, so I don't think it really fits into what they're trying to do. No, you got to turn it over. A Suffolk County DA lost his job recently because of that. A Nassau County ADA lost his job because of Brady violations. So you now know what Brady violations are. We talk about it often on my show. Uh, when Frank Vetro and I did uh, radio a while back, we were the only group talking about Brady violations, but it, it profoundly affects people. So were there Brady, Brady violations in your trial? Yes. Specifically, the medical examiner had been complained of by, uh, in, by district attorney and other law enforcement in a neighboring county uh, where he was moonlighting as a defense expert. There was concern that he was not testifying truthfully over there. Even from the prosecutor? Yes, be yes because he, he was... Uh, the, he was a medical examiner in Westchester County right. on the side of law enforcement, even though as a scientist he's supposed to be objective and neutral. Right. That aside, he's still working for the government. Sure. Uh, in neighboring county, he was not working for the government. He was, he was being hired as an expert, like a defense attorney might. And he was being complained of in neighboring counties that he wasn't giving 
uh, truthful testimony. So that documentation had been withheld. So there was that aspect of it. And then, when did you learn of that? During the during the um, discovery process of the lawsuit, 16 years later, after I was right. exonerated. Of course, well after the trial. Well after the trial, yes. And the second aspect of it um, is that when the uh, so there was a hair comparison made, and uh, when it didn't match me, the prosecutor re re resorted to arguing by inference. He suddenly claimed, well, these hairs, which originated, <clears throat> the, he said, from, the, uh, from a person of uh, Negroid and uh, Mongoloid origin, whereas I'm Caucasian. Mm -hmm. So when the hair expert learned that that was the way the prosecutor was going to answer that piece of mm -hmm. evidence, he asked the prosecutor to provide him with hair samples from both of those individuals so he could do the actual comparison. And that evidence was never turned over to him. So I never knew I of that o omission. See, it's, it's unfortunate that, and you know, obviously you know Frank Vetro very well. Very well. And I yes. represented him after the conviction and civil cases and criminal cases. And he did not know a lot of the things that he hadn't been, his attorney hadn't been given until years, years, and years later. Right. Which is a problem because, yes. you know, for him, he didn't really serve jail time the way you did. Right. But if he didn't bring that lawsuit, if you didn't bring a suit later on, you would have never known about this. And Correct. Yeah, which, which is one of the arguments that I use. This is my capacity as an advocate. Um, you know, a couple of years ago with the uh, It Could Happen to You Coalition, we were able uh, to gather a lot of the groups and advocates together, and we helped pass discovery reform in New York, which uh, pertains to sharing information between the prosecution mm -hmm. and, and the defense. And one of the arguments that I used to make as an advocate working with that group is that, you know, it's backwards that I have greater discovery rights as a plaintiff bringing this That's federal right. lawsuit than I did when I was a defendant originally defending myself against the false charges, which ultimately caused, you know, uh, that resulted in my being wrongfully imprisoned. Right. And too often the prosecutor is, they hold the cards. And I always say the most powerful law firm in every county is the district attorney's office. No question. Absolutely. More than the county attorney, more than, you could have the greatest law firm that ever existed. They don't have the resources that the DA has. And they get that information. So even like, let's say the OJ trial, mm -hmm. that defense team learned about things because it was a high profile case. People call them. They get random calls. Oh, by the way, this guy used the N-word 20 years ago in a book, and he happens to be a witness. In a case like yours, which wasn't necessarily, and the murder cases tend to be more high profile than other types, but your case wasn't the OJ trial. No, it certainly wasn't on the level right. of OJ. We got plenty of pretrial coverage, but nowhere near OJ. You're right. correct. So less opportunity for people, let's say, OJ is a California, people in, sitting in New York could say, oh, I remember when that witness said this or that. So as a defense attorney, things are going to fall into your lap in a very high profile case, like an OJ case or somebody yeah. like that. Yes. In your case, less so. So your defense attorney is relying on the honesty of the prosecutor to turn over that documentation. If they don't do it, like you said, as a plaintiff, you, Frank Vetro, other people I've heard, got information that they didn't get at the trial. And had they gotten it, it would have made a difference. And then years later, they maybe argue, or you, you told me a little while ago, rever you know, harmless error. There's a right. thing called reversible error where the case would go back, potentially, or harmless error. So tell us a little bit about where you've heard cases where clearly a violation, but they called it harmless error. Well, in the John, in the John uh, Juca case, I know Doreen His mom Juca. is going to be coming on next week? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. So the prosecution, um, you know, withheld uh, information about their last second jailhouse, uh, jailhouse informant. And then, uh, you know, which showed that uh, he was supposed to have been violated a number mm -hmm. of times for violating probation conditions. And then, you know, he had psychological issues, which you know, that was never informed to, to, to the defense. And then that was compounded. Of that witness, you're of saying? Of that witness, of witness, yes. And that mm -hmm. was compounded by the prosecutor's argument to the jury, well, he has nothing to benefit. He doesn't have anything to gain. For once in his life, he wants to, <laughs> he's trying to do, do the, the right, right thing. thing. Exactly. Okay, <laughs> you know, so, uh, that, so that was an example. And then and the appellate division, in fact, unanimously rever reversed John Juca's conviction on prosecutorial misconduct grounds, you know, the Brady violation. But then the Court of Appeals... Right reinstated the conviction in a six to one vote, arguing that it was harmless. But the whole thing, let me ask you, you, know, you were a lawyer, mm -hmm. okay? Still are. Still are. Okay. Do you bother to engage in tactics in the courtroom if you think it's not gonna help you? Absolutely not. You, it's you a waste of your time, isn't it? It's a waste of your time. So if the prosecutor 
uh, thought that something was harmless, right, they wouldn't have bothered to engage in the misconduct. That's what frustrates me. And to me, the last point I'll make on this is that once misconduct has infected a case, the lens of that case, right, the way it's viewed, sure. everything is irreversibly altered. The whole view and trajectory of the case is different at that point. Right. See, and I know as, as a practicing attorney for 30 years, former prosecutor, that cases like a drug case, they're more likely to follow the law more exactly and toss it than they will in a murder and a rape case because there's more of a victim. Right. And I've seen, if you see a lot of the cases where they toss out a conviction, a lot of times it's drug cases. Like they illegally got the drugs from the guy's house. We're tossing that. But then you have a murder case and well, they illegally got that scarf that had this on it, but they don't say it this way, but it's a murder and rape case, so we're gonna allow that in because we wanna make sure that this guy gets convicted. It almost, it almost seems like that. Yeah, so, so it does seem that way. The law is the law, and you said even though you, you fight for legislation, it's got to be followed. Yes. If it's not followed, it doesn't matter. Right, because ultimately, you know, you run <clears throat> over someone's rights in order for them to be found convicted because you, you use the seriousness of the charge to justify that. In the end of the day, everybody's right to a fair trial, but, you know, it is ultimately compromised. Yes. And to me, the only way of restoring somebody's right to a fair trial once misconduct has happened is to, in fact, give them another trial. When we say toss, we're not saying, hey, let's let him go. We're saying that this conviction was obtained in a, in a tainted way that's a violation of either their constitutional rights, their rights under the New York State Constitution, right, or, or, other, uh, or other courtroom procedure, court law. Um, judicial law. So the only way to restore that is let's let's give them another trial that's fair. Okay. And that's all we're saying. And if we can have a fair trial, then we can have a lot more confidence in the accuracy of the outcome. Right. And and again, if that's the wrong guy, you better start looking for the guy that did it. Or yes. the woman, depending on the case. Now, you have a foundation called the Jeffrey Deskovic Foundation for Justice. And you said you work with also It Could Happen to You as a coalition. Tell us a little bit about your foundation. Yeah, so I started the foundation um, using some of the money I received as um, compensation. It took five years for me to get compensated for what happened to me. And at that point, I wanted to go beyond just the public education and legislative part to it. I wanted mm -hmm. to actually get into the exoneration game, so to speak, to help directly free people. Um, so I started the foundation, and we've been able to free uh, seven wrongfully convicted people. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also are able to um, help pass legislation pertaining to uh, identification procedures, uh, videotaping interrogation, DNA data bank. Uh, so it could happen to you as a statewide coalition, and it's made up of exonerees, people falsely accused. But Is that a quitting. private or government? No, it's a, it's a, it's a 501c3. It's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. So, um, uh, so people falsely accused but acquitted. Uh, indiv uh, criminal justice reform organizations, uh, formerly incarcerated people, uh, individual advocates, uh, friends and family of people who allege that they're wrongfully mm -hmm. imprisoned, and just everyday concerned citizens. So the idea is that it's easier for the legislature to ignore an individual organization, the go it alone approach. But if we have a statewide coalition, then uh, we have a better chance of, uh, of being heard. And so working with that group, we were able to pass some legislation in New York. I referenced Discovery before. Uh, before that, we were able to pass the country's first Commission on Prosecutor Conduct, so an independent oversight board for prosecutors. And I'm sure you got some uh, pushback on that one. Oh, we, yes, we did. We fought against the um, District Attorneys Association of New York. Uh, they, went, they were kicking and screaming the whole, during the whole eight-year fight. Mm -hmm. But eventually we got, it, uh, we got it passed because, you know, there were many, many wrongful conviction cases coming out in which prosecutorial misconduct was a factor mm -hmm. and you know and so uh, you know we, we had that and we you know we did a white paper and it cost this much money just for these 10 cases that could have been avoided so we had an argument for any elected official and it was a bipartisan piece of legislation which is what I loved you know so our sponsor of the bill was Senator DeFrancisco who was a, a conservative Republican from upstate mm -hmm. New York and then on the assembly side we had Assemblyman Nick Perry who's pretty much is well I won't say he's left of left but he's you know, he's a Democrat, and that, that's, he's, mm -hmm. he's pretty solid, uh, you know, in that um, political view. So we passed the, we passed the bill. Uh, so in terms of what we're doing now, so the District Attorneys Association, they brought a lawsuit challenging the constitutionality of the, of the statute. And the, um, the judge rejected um, all of their arguments except for one. He found a problem in the uh, appellate procedure. It was so, the Court of Appeals now? Uh, no, it's Did it go not, to the Court of Appeals? Uh, no, it did not. No, because... Um, 
Uh, we thought that the, the judge's decision in finding a problem with the appeal, appellate process, we thought that he was correct in that, and so we're repassing the Good. legislation to make Rather the, than fight it, you're Rather gonna... than fight it, we're going to just repass the bill. Let's take it. He gave us a roadmap of what he, at least one judge, thought that's would be smart, an acceptable... That's a smart thing to do, because too often a, a party will just fight, 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 even if they're dead wrong. Now, now right. as far as... And look, I'm a, firm, a former prosecutor, so I, I'd like to say this. Mm. It is a very, very tough job, very important job, yes. as being, being a prosecutor. And I want to say my experience has always been as a, an assistant DA and dealing with them positive. I don't think, just like with cops, I don't think there were all these DAs running around that want innocent people to be convicted. But what, I happen, what I think happens sometimes is some prosecutors get a case. There's a lot of pressure on them mm -hmm. to get a conviction. Uh, in your case, a 15-year-old girl was raped and murdered. The prosecutor thought it was you. He, just like a cop who, who makes an arrest. He, he believes that that person committed that crime. But if the rules aren't followed, right, the, the wrong outcome can happen. Right. That's the problem. So I think some prosecutors, like I said, if, if you looked at it, most, would you say most mm -hmm. prosecutors want the right outcome? Yeah, I would they say want, most of them do. Right, because I don't know, think of, or even there a cop, who wants, the, who wants the, the, the bad guy to still be out there? If you're a true prosecutor, when I was a prosecutor, I wanted to get it right. Yeah, you know? sure. Do I know everything? You know, was I omniscient? No. But you want to get it right. And when you're a prosecutor, you have a lot of power to make sure you get it right. Just like with an investigation with the police. They can steer the investigation in a certain way. They can question people in a certain way. They can withhold things in a certain way. But they got to follow the rules. And I think some of the legislation you're working on is, is toward that end. Yeah, it's absolutely towards that end. And I want to just piggyback off your point, which is to say that uh, there tend to be serial violators. You know, people, once they do it once and then they, then they keep going, sure. and before you know it, the culture, you know, changes. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the whole theory of having the commission is that there would be an independent body that has subpoena power. Yeah, oversight. You know, the oversight. I mean, yeah. every profession has it. Sure. We have it. You know, and I got to say, like, I would say lawyers will be more likely to call out other lawyers than maybe doctors would call out other doctors or engineers would call out engineers because, like, think about it. If, if I did a closing and a check bounced, that was an escrow check, I have to do something about that. Otherwise, I can get in trouble, whereas maybe one doctor might cover for another doctor. So lawyers, I think we get rat out all the time, the bad ones anyway. Yes. And, and that's how it should be, because they will give us a bad name, especially with a criminal case. Look at the consequences, not just money. Right, no. People, people's lives. Yes. And then when you, in some places, I don't know if they, they really exist much anymore, maybe a few limited places, the death penalty. Right. That's a whole other show. Right. Which we, we've talked about. I used to be yes. for the death penalty. I got to admit it. I used to be for the death penalty. I remember one time at Fordham University and at one of my classes debating uh, a Jesuit priest where he was against the death penalty and I was for it. And I remember, and, and it's funny, that was a culture at the time where you could speak your mind. Now yes. some colleges yeah. You know, if you have a conservative position, you might not want to say it too loudly if you want to get a good grade. But back, back then, I could speak my mind. I loved it. Now, I look at it as when I see things like what happened to you, Marty Tankliff, other things you read about, how could you be for the death penalty? Not even from a morality position. Just from, just from, from, just from the risk of executing an innocent person, which they exactly. made a study that came out that they estimated maybe as many as 4% of mm -hmm. the people on death row were, uh, were actually innocent. Right. And the thing is this, if, let's say you had, you, you were put to death. Yes. The right guy would, would have, have never, never been, been found. found. Think about that. The right guy would have never been found if they put you to death. Yes, right. I, I, exactly. You know, I want to point out, I'm piggybacking off that point. You know, the majority of people that are exonerated, by the time they're exonerated, it, it's, it's normally through a post-conviction procedure, not through an appeal. The appeals have typically been over and exhausted right. a long time, and then the exoneration happens years later when some new evidence is discovered. Mm -hmm. Now, in applying that context, the framework, uh, to a death penalty case, when the appeals are over, they're going to carry out the penalty. They're unless, gonna the execute, governor unless the governor intervenes or something. Yeah, barring some extra, you know, ordinary type of, uh, you know, uh, intervention, the, 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 the penalty is uh, executed and the defendant is executed. So mm -hmm. they wouldn't have been alive to have been exonerated. Right. Now, have you had heard about any cases where the technology didn't exist at a particular time to exonerate someone, but thank God evidence was kept? And then years later, like I've, I've seen TV shows about that, 
where all of a sudden now they have a better DNA test or they have something they didn't have then. Did you, have you seen that or have you used new technology to exonerate somebody that was convicted? Well, you're looking at somebody right now who was freed because who's only home because of the advancement of DNA technology. Uh, let me quickly put some color to sure. that. So before I went to trial, the DNA did not match me. Uh, so back then, the technology was RFLP. So they could only compare DNA from a crime scene to a particular suspect. Got they compared that to me. There's didn't, no database didn't match or anything, me. right? That's where I'm going. Uh, what changed Sorry 16 years later, <laughs> hi, <laughs> it's fine. What changed was that the DNA data bank was created, which allowed them to take crime scene evidence, put it in the database, and com you know, compare that to everyone in the database, and it matched the actual perpetrator. Because remember, he, he, when he killed the second victim, he got caught, and, uh, and as a result of that, um, his DNA was put into the data bank when it was created. And right. so in that way, it, it incriminated him and exonerated me, and I was then able to take that evidence and argue newly discovered evidence. So if he had never been convicted of a felony, because that's the law, you have to be convicted of a felony, you've got to do the swab, you might not have been exonerated because there was nobody to compare it to. Right, right. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. with the caveat that, I mean, I remember they did, they did move to include um, certain misdemeanor uh, mm -hmm. convictions. Uh, by mm -hmm. the way, I I'll share with you, okay, uh, just... As an advocate, when, there, when that debate was being held legislatively, whether to expand the database or not, I was a proponent of expanding the data bank. To misdemeanors. To misdemeanors, even though everyone else in the innocence community and on the defense side had a totally different position. For me, you know, innocence was key. And I wanted the database to be as big as it could be to right. maximize the chances that, that an actual perpetrator would be caught. Right. So thereby, you know, bringing mm -hmm. him to justice and exonerating the wrongfully convicted um, person. And I think that's fair because, look, obviously, I don't have to give my DNA. I'm right. not charged with anything. I'm not convicted of anything. Right. Anybody, we have rights, you know. But a felony, we know, you mm -hmm. have to, we, you had to, mm -hmm. now misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. So it's not that much of a leap. It's still somebody that committed a crime. You're in a database. You have to look at the pros and cons, a person's rights, mm -hmm. but also the ability to get somebody down the road that committed a crime, and if, it's, if the misdemeanors were not included in the database, a lot of cases would not be solved. Exactly right, yes. So we're not talking about a violation of law. No, we're not talking a about a violation. Traffic ticket. Traffic ticket. Uh, we're not even talking about if you were charged but acquitted. We're acquitted, saying right. upon convicted. conviction. Mm -hmm. Yes. Upon conviction. It was interesting, I was, do, I was listening to a, a, a seminar, which I hate to do the seminars uh, on online. I like to be sitting in, I'm old yeah, school. I of like course. School. And one of the things was evidence. And this is very fascinating. You should watch this. It talked about when you impeach a witness, mm -hmm. you can say, were well, you convicted of a crime? And however, if they're still in the appeals process. They can say no. Right. And you won't be able to get an answer because technically they, they may have been found guilty at the trial, but in the appeals process, what if they're cleared? Right. Then the answer, it's like retroactive. Then yeah. you didn't do it. Right. Like, look, it, it'd be like saying, well, you, you, you were a murderer for a period of time. You were exonerated. So it goes all the way back. Right. So even though you did time for a crime you didn't commit, if, you, if someone asked you a question, were you convicted of a crime? Yeah, legally I'm allowed to say no because it's as if it never happened. If it's as if it never happened. Yes. Right. So anyway, but, all right. So tell us about, oh, well, this is what I wanted to ask. And I, people often ask me when I talk about who's coming on my show. How do you get business? How do you get referrals? So people, people hear of me. I, I do a lot of uh, media interviews, television, radio, print media, new media. And so uh, friends and family of people who are, who are in, who are in prison um, bring me to the attention of the prisoners. But then also I'm kind of a legend in the law libraries sure, throughout I'm the New sure. York State prison system. Do they name any libraries after you? <laughs> Not yet, but I, would, but I would like one, though. Okay. Yeah, so people hear of me. work on that. People hear <laughs> of me, and, you know, like I said, I do a lot of media and I speak out. I'm not like one of those people that once you're exonerated, you get your initial hit of five minutes of fame you're and gone. you disappear. No, mm -hmm. I've kept the ball rolling and I figured out how to stay current. And, and then, you know, my, my life is this. I know I didn't just, just transition to a normal life. You know, right. I eat, sleep, breathe, you know, fight and wrongful conviction. And, and with a law a degree, it gives you a little more power to be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. That was why I decided to go, and go to law school. I graduated Pace Law in... Um, May uh, 2019, I'm pending admission right now, and, mm -hmm. and so uh, we'll be, I want to be able to uh, free people um, as, as the attorney, and then also I do believe, I know that the law degree, that extra credential will help me in my um, policy initiatives as well. I think well. it does. It gives you a little more oomph. 
juice. Yes, as I would it, say. it does. Now, but when someone comes to you and says, I have a cousin who's in jail and he didn't commit that crime. Yes. Do you send somebody to talk to that individual? Do you say, give me some of the file? How do you sift through it? Because not everybody, I'm sure, that says they're innocent is innocent. No, absolutely not. No, we have a vetting process, and we're not that naive to think that right. everybody right, that claims it is, because I was innocent doesn't mean everyone else who's saying it is. Mm. Uh, so, Like the jails are all full of innocent people, like the joke goes, right? That, like, so, like, and, like the joke and There are innocent people in jail, but yes. how do you sift through? What's your vetting process? Sure. Our vetting process is we ask for certain legal documents. So specifically, we ask for the uh, direct appeal briefs from the prosecution and the defense, and the way that we use that is that's our cliff notes. We use it just for the Got factual it. section, mm -hmm. you know, because only if we approve the case would we then go into the actual transcript and read several thousand pages, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we ask for that. We ask for the police reports, if there's any lab reports, and if there's any expert testimony beyond uh, the medical examiner. And we have them fill out a questionnaire. So the first thing is we look at the questionnaire and we see what pieces of evidence were used. We cross-check that with the appeal briefs, make sure no one's left anything out. And then we undergo a second level of analysis in which uh, we scrutinize what was used as evidence, right? And we know, say a case had a confession in it. Well, we know what the red flags are that a confession was coerced and false based on the, uh, the exonerations that have happened through DNA and false confession cases. So we look at the evidence and we look for patterns and red flags as established by other cases that have already mm -hmm. ended in DNA exoneration. So we look at that. So we ask ourselves, does the applicant have at least a colorable claim of actual innocence? Yeah. And number two, do we see a potential route for victory? Because once you've been convicted, the burden of proof shifts to the defendant, and you now have to prove that you were, that you were innocent. Mm -hmm. So only if we say yes to both of those questions do we actually take a case. Uh, let me give an example of a case that we declined to take. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, the, uh, the defendant, there, was, there, were, uh, there were weapons found in, in, the, in the applicant's, uh, in, in his room. It was in, in the house. And his argument was, well, I was renting a room in, in the house. And so anybody had access, had access. to my room and could mm -hmm. have put, could have put the, the guns in there. So we wrote back a letter and we said, yeah, but like, tell us about the other people in the house and why would they take a chance at storing firearms in your room where they, you could walk in at any time and find them? Mm -hmm. And his answer to that was, well, the cops searched my room in violation of my Fourth Amendment rights. So mm -hmm. that evidence was improperly admitted, and we therefore want you, an innocent entity, to exclude that from your calculation as to whether you think that I'm innocent or not. Well, you that did, and that didn't fly, obviously. It, mm -hmm. was, uh, it was laughable, actually. And we, we said, next. You know, but the mm -hmm. unfortunate thing is the time that we did spend on that case could have better went to somebody who was actually innocent. But you don't have a crystal ball. so We don't have a crystal ball. There comes a time when you're looking, you're vetting the case, there's an aha moment. Yes. And how does, could it either be, like in this case, there was an aha moment. No, 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 we're not going forward with this. Right. When you have the aha moment and you said, you know what, this guy might really be innocent. Mm. Do you, and a 440 motion probably comes into play in a lot of these cases. Yes, absolutely, okay? of course. Who does that 440? Does he have to have an attorney do it? Do mm -hmm. you guys do it for him? How does that happen? A 440 motion, mm -hmm. you can just explain a little bit. Yeah, so a 440 motion is a post-conviction motion, and it diff it's different from an appeal. So what a 440 motion is saying is that I'm going to enlarge in the record and put new facts in that wasn't mm -hmm. known, and I'm then going to make legal arguments based on those mm -hmm. facts. And you could make an actual innocence argument. You know, and then you could also make a newly discovered evidence argument. You can make a Brady claim. Pretty expensive. Yeah. Pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, so previously, I had uh, I had a uh, hired staff, and so in house we were doing we were actually firing um, firing filing the motion. Uh, the, the motion. Yeah. But frankly, um, you know, our fundraising didn't go well, and so after three and a half years of just writing a large check, I had to get rid of the paid employees and convert the entity to a volunteer uh, entity, and so. Uh, you well, law students, things like so, that? Yeah, so we have interns, law students, and when we vetted cases, uh, there's about five lawyers that work with us, and they're looking for a good case where someone is innocent and they see a route to victory. We pitch the case to them, you know, which includes our battle plan in contemplation of their taking the case pro bono and carrying out our plan and filing the motion in which we would remain consulting with them and contribute uh, timely media and other grassroots tactics. So that's the way we're working now. We have 10 cases that are, uh, that are active. Uh, there's another five that are approved and waiting. But that's just to have something to do now. 
But really, the goal is, you know, I'm in the process of mm -hmm. trying to raise money to again have full in-house staff, investigators, paralegals, and attorneys. That can really focus that can on really, Yeah, that can, let's go hard 40, 50 hours rather than I'm going to rely on Phil. You know, he's going to do the case, but he's going to fit it in in between all the, of his other work. The students have a lot of other things on their plate. Uh, the students and even the, the, the lawyers, you know, even, sure. the, even the lawyers. Sure. But we would look, rather have the better way that's to do it. That's your job. Is, do what you got to do. Yes, and, that's it. Give 40, 50 hours every week on this case, and let's get it done. Now, I'm sure you've had cases where a 440 motion was already made, mm -hmm. and you can get a lot of information in those 440 motions. I remember before I had Marty Tankliff on one of my shows, I went through the 4040 motion, and that's what really convinced me of his innocence. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, in an appeal, you know, in an appeal, you can find that information too, but in the 440 motion, there were things that were put in that 440 motion, like, for instance, and you know this, polygraph test. Mm -hmm. Polygraph tests are allowed in 440 motions, but they're not admissible, not in New York, New Mexico they are, but at trial. Right. So a 440 motion, you can throw in there, this particular witness failed a polygraph. Well, right. you passed the polygraph. You're not going to see that at a trial. Now, is it perfect evidence? No. But it gives you an idea of something. Yeah, and just for our audience, I mean, you're not going to win the case based on that, but if you have something else, that can't be your lead. But if you right. have some other piece and then you throw that in, you know, that can be a persuasive secondary uh, factor that the judge right. will take into account. And certainly in terms of uh, uh, as, a, as an attorney or as an organization, the fact that your client took and passed the polygraph, that would certainly be a confidence factor internally as to why you might go ahead right. with the case. Right. Well, well, would you take a case if you found out that the defendant you were going to put a lot of effort into exonerate pitifully failed a polygraph test? Is that something you consider it, of course, right? In terms of other yeah, I things? yeah. So I've never been in that scenario. Uh, I would, I would, it, I would have to consider whether I wanted to go forward with them or, or not. It, it would be a question. It's not an automatic no or yes because remember also, right? The reason why polygraphs, with the exception of New Mexico, you mentioned, are not admissible, uh, is be, is because uh, they're not scientific, and sometimes mm -hmm. they are in fact. Uh, failed by frightened innocent people. All right, the whole premise of the polygraph is that when a person tells a lie, you'll become nervous and that will result in an increased pulse rate. Right. The polygraph measures the pulse rate. And in fact, I, I failed. I failed the polygraph test uh, by, by, by law enforcement, just as an example. Of course, that was, under, that was under much different conditions than what we're talking about it would be because the polygraph is expert in, in my case. He was um, a Putnam County Sheriff's investigator and he carried out this procedure, which he referred to as GTC, uh, get the confession. I see. So mm -hmm. it was not exactly, even as unscientific as polygraphs are, remember intelligence agents are trained on how to beat the polygraph in case they're, they're, they're captured when they're undercover. Right. But even all that as it is, even by that unscientific measure, that was not the procedure that the polygraph is carried out I for see. me. Right, yeah. Like in fact, very quickly, in the, mm. Tankliff case, in the 440 motion, mm. the night that the parents were killed, mm. a witness later on said, I drove two individuals to the Tankliff house in Beltaire. And he said the next day, one of the witnesses, he went to one of the witnesses' houses, and the guy was in the backyard with like a drum burning, uh, I think, the hoodie and the jeans that he had. Wow. That's pretty powerful. That's really powerful Very evidence. Powerful. Like, what, what's the motive of getting rid of your genes and the night before? And so that guy underwent a polygraph, the witness, the driver of the car, and he passed the polygraph. So that's something, again, not meant for a jury, but a judge, let's say, deciding whether or not you get back in the game, that is very, very powerful. Yeah, it certainly is. Extremely powerful information. Yes. And that was in the 440 that I read. Yes, yeah. Because, I, in fact, I was in the office when the tank of murder, I wasn't a homicide prosecutor, but I remember it. Mm -hmm. And your first thinking is, oh, he confessed, right? Right. You always think of, if there's a confession to the layperson, he must be guilty, right? Like mm -hmm. you said, yeah, it's there common was a, confe thought. People there was a confession that. in yours, but yes. you got to look deeper than that. But it does and potentially taint a jury oh, for because sure. they're going to say, I would never admit to something I didn't do. Right. But so, it happens. Right. Ad and addressing that point. So in, uh, from, the, from the body of exonerations that have happened through DNA evidence, uh, coerced false confessions have been the cause of wrongful convictions in 25% of those cases. Wow. That's pretty high. Wrongful, so, so a quarter of the time, mm -hmm. DNA exonerates a person, but that same person made some type of admission. Correct. In the, yes. And wow. then going beyond that, 
uh, false confession experts have determined that while adults have given coerced false confessions, that particularly vulnerable populations would include right. youth and people with mental health issues. Sure, it's easier to, easy to break them down. Yes. And you can make promises, hey, look, just say you were there, and it might not even be a full confession. Say, look, just say you were at the scene, right? Maybe you, know, you don't know what happened. And just say you're at, and then they put the person at the scene who might not have been at the scene, but he, in his mind, okay, I'll just say I was there, but I didn't do it. I'll, I'll sort this out later. Right, yeah, a lot of people think that they'll, <laughs> they'll sort it out later. And, you know, and, and, you know, threats come into play, false promises. So I was given a false promise, for example. So the, um, they played the game good cop, bad cop. You oh, know? Sure. And the cop who was pretending to be my friend, who I was also looking up to as a father figure, he told me, um, look, the co other cops are going to harm you. I can't hold them off anymore. Uh, just tell them what they want, you and, and you're going to go home afterwards. Look, they're not gonna, you're not going to be arrested. You're going to go home and afterwards. you're a 17 year old kid, scared out of your mind. 16 at that point. Six wow. Yes, remember, the 17 wow. was at the trial. That's right. So the arrest was 16. Yeah, and he says, look, you're not going to be arrested. You know, just tell them what they what, what they want to hear, and yeah, you know, sure. and, I, and I and I believed it. You know, unfortunately, I was just and I was desperate and I was frightened. You know, uh, but moving another point I wanted to um, make is when you're in that moment, you're not thinking about the long term. You're just trying to get out of there. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Right. Now I remember in Marty Tankler's case. I think it was his first day of his senior year, and and um, he was told his father had survived. Right. Yes, and his father said that he that he did it. So he's being told these things, and again, he's about seventeen at the time, and you end up you're thinking about the moment. You're not thinking no sixteen, seventeen, or even person in that position is thinking. Well, at trial, that's going to be a problem for me. They're not thinking about it that way. No, they're not. And now, in Marty's case in particular, so there's two different <clears throat> types of um, uh, coerced false confession. You have the coerced compliant. Right, where the person is just coerced into making a false confession. Like a but, phone book that they used to use in Suffolk County years ago? Right. And, you know, and obviously the Beating person... Beating with a phone book, that is. Yeah, yeah, of course. The whole theory with that is it doesn't leave marks. That was what that was about. Exactly. Uh, but, the, but the person who's making the confession is well aware of the fact that they're, they, that they're innocent. But then you have what's called the internalized false confession, which is when the suspect momentarily doubts their old innocence. So in the Tankliff mm -hmm. case, them saying, well, that his stepfather came to and said that you did it, it caused Marty to momentarily uh, doubt his innocence. Mm -hmm. Now, he shortly recanted after that, but that one moment, and it was, uh, and it was, it was, it was too late. But I want to just add one other quick point that I didn't make before, uh, talking about false confessions, um, which, which is that the... You know, the innocence of a suspect can work against them in, in terms of their decision whether to waive their rights or not. Right. You know, the police would, you know, anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. So the innocence of suspects works against them in the sense that they think that, well, I didn't do it. So they'll and I don't know prove. anything about it either. So they'll so, never be able to convict me. Well, exactly. What can possibly go wrong <laughs> if I waive my rights and speak to the, the police without an attorney? But actually, you know, quite a bit can, yeah. uh, can actually go wrong. Yeah, a very dangerous attitude. Did you testify at trial? I did not. That is a really big regret that I have. Uh, my attorney told me not to testify. Uh, in, in hindsight, it was clearly the wrong decision. So... There's an 80% conviction rate in cases that have a confession. So if you're defending uh, your client and there's a confession, as you said, the common thought that the public has and the jury's made up of the public is, well, I would never confess. So if you, you know, you're behind the eight ball if you're facing that as evidence. So you have to answer that confession. You, your client has to testify. You have to explain why did you falsely confess. Right. And then your lawyer, secondarily, has to try to disprove as many aspects of the confession as he or she can. Mm -hmm in order to marshal it all together in that closing sure. argument. To, my attorney didn't do any of that. No. He wouldn't allow me to testify. So remember, in my confession, uh, the, I was threatened. There was a false promise. The cops left it out of their testimony. I wanted mm -hmm. to testify to add those facts to it, but he wouldn't allow me to. He didn't present my alibi evidence. He didn't try to attack the confession when his defense is turned to uh, present the case. And as a result of that, I was, I was convicted. You know, I spent 16 years now, in if, prison. You now, if you hadn't, let's say, gave, given a confession, you're saying then that might have been the right decision not to testify. But because you had confessed, the jury's left with that confession. Yes. They want to see you 
say, I didn't do it. Why I confessed or why I said what I did, they want to see that. Yes, absolutely. They absolutely want to see that, yes. Because without that, they're going to say, he didn't, he didn't give me a satisfactory answer. Even though the burden is not on you to prove your innocence, let's be honest. Let's be in the real world. Let's practice <laughs> right. law in the real world. Let's move past the legal maxims. And in reality, if there's a confession, and you, you, know, you have to answer that confession, you got to get up there on the stand and say sure. that you didn't do it, and you have to explain why you falsely confessed, and then as many ways as you can disprove each fact in that confession, as many as you can disprove, or even show that the police gave details that's all key. That is strategy. That's strategy right. 101. And don't forget, the prosecutor has the burden beyond a reasonable doubt. If you can punch holes in that confession, right. and I've done this before in cases that I've had, where you can punch holes where the jury's left with, I don't know what the heck to believe. As right. a defense attorney, that's beautiful. You want, as a defense attorney, you want the jury to say, we don't know what to believe. Because right. what does that mean? That's reasonable doubt. I had a case very quickly, very quickly, we're running out of time, where um, there was an allegation of a, a threat made over the phone. There was a tape. It was hard to tell. It wasn't the world's greatest tape. The DA had my client's phone records that the call was made. My client came to me and said, I never made that call. So I contacted a spoofing expert. You heard of spoofing? Mm -hmm. And he's saying, I never made that call. I went out and got his records from a different source. No phone call. So the DA gets up there and says, I have his phone records. He made the call. I got up there and I said, I have his phone records. He didn't make the call. He was found not guilty because the jury didn't know what to believe. I spoke to them afterwards. And they're like, when we heard there were phone records, because the prosecutor goes first. Although in my opening, I was very suspect. I, was, I, I didn't want to raise the bar too high. Right. And so the jury said to me, when the prosecutor has a phone records and your client saying, I didn't make the phone call, he's guilty. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But then we see records from another reliable source that I got into evidence mm. that says he didn't make the call. What do you think? So the same thing with the confession. You have to give the, your attorney has to do something. Yeah, give a competing narrative. Give a competing narrative to say he didn't make the call. So even if the jury says, I don't know what to believe, that's still a win for the That's defendant. That's still a win for the defense. Because, be, right, because the burden of proof is on the prosecution, guilt beyond a reasonable right. doubt. We only have about a minute and a half left. What are your goals for the future? Where do you, I know you said you want to hire a full-time staff. Where do you, what next level do you want to get to? I would like to get to the, where I have, do I have a full-time staff? You know, attorney, um, attorneys, uh, paralegals, uh, investigators, other essential personnel on staff. So I would like to be able to ramp up our case capacity. Uh, we, we're trying to repass the, the commission. We're trying to get rid of the exceptions to videotaping interrogations. And we're trying to bring that oversight to other states. And I'm hoping to not be pending admission anymore. I want to sure. actually have the law license exonerate a lot of people and help them get compensated on the back end. I'd like to increase my profile. Right. And not just a New York not just, based not just New York organization. Based. Right. Correct. You know, the ultimate dream is I'd, like, I'd love to copy the ACLU model in the sense that they have an office in every state. So uh, wrongful conviction is a problem countrywide. It's a problem worldwide. So the ultimate, ultimate goal would be to have an office in every country. The only thing is, Phil, in that the other uh, countries, you don't hear about the wrongful convictions, not because they're not happening, it's because nobody's being exonerated. That's right. Now, I want to just use a hockey analogy. In the movie Miracle, mm -hmm. when he's talking about how he wants to take on the Russians and win, mm. one of the guys from the NHL said, that's a lofty goal. And his answer was, that's why I want to pursue it. What you're saying is a lofty goal. Yes. Right? And even if you don't get to that level, you're going to get to a bigger level than you are now. So shoot for the stars. Yes. And even if you fall a little bit short, you're going to be a heck of a lot closer than if you just sit around and opine as to how things could get better. So I really, I really want to commend you. you did a, you're doing a great job. I'm going to have you on my radio show. Anything I can do to help you out. I try to, to be there on the second line. You're on the front line. I want to commend you for that. Thank you. Thank I want you to thank my, my uh, viewers and, and the listeners. I'm also on uh, Facebook, and I'm also on YouTube. It's Phil Giacino is the YouTube channel. If you missed this show or other shows, go to that and see it, and you'll be hearing more from uh, Jeffrey Deskovic. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. I just want to say if people would like to um, uh, get in touch with me, they can email me through the website, deskovic.org. We're always looking for people to uh, contribute to the cause and help in other ways. Very good. You have a great day. Take care.